Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I want to start by expressing how amazing it feels to have the opportunity to moderate the last panel uh, in the main stage at FOSDEM. Um, thank you so much to all of the volunteers and the organizers who have made this incredible weekend happen. Um, I just want to express that I've seen so much passion, innovativeness, and creativity from the open source community that we are all a part of and um, really appreciate it. For those who don't know me, I'm Dan Brown from Linux Foundation Energy. I've spent the last 10 years supporting open source communities. And what keeps me going is the knowledge that open source is not just a software methodology. Um, it's not just a community even, it's a philosophy. And one that is having a massive impact on the world for good. And that's what we're here to talk about today. I'm privileged to be on stage with some truly intelligent, passionate, generous, hardworking, creative people. And I hope that we inspire you to join us in a new initiative that we believe will help improve the lives of, of people all around the world. So to give a little bit of background, it might seem obvious, but without energy and electricity, there wouldn't actually be any technology. So none of us would have jobs in tech and open source wouldn't exist um, without stable, accessible energy systems. <clears throat> but as much as energy has benefited the world, it's also had unintended consequences. We're all aware of the challenges and dangers posed by climate change. And if we do not change the way that we produce and use energy, then the future is bleak. So we've come here to ask you to help us prevent that worst case outcome. The panel is going to give you an overview of some of the challenges that we've identified that we feel the open source community can help address for the benefit of people all over the world. To set the stage, the current state of power systems is not very different than it was 100 years ago. Um, and that's a problem. It's inefficient, it's centralized, it's top-down, proprietary for the most part. These are all things that the open source community can recognize as far from ideal. So we're going to present a proposal to you that can help us change that, not only for those of us in the developed world, but for individuals millions of whom, even in 2004, don't even have access to electricity. So with that, I'm going to introduce our esteemed panel, who are going to tell you more about our idea and our proposal to expand on the work that is already being done at Linux Foundation Energy and other open source initiatives to decarbonize electric systems. We want this to be interactive, so I'm only going to ask one or two questions to each panelist and then encourage you all um, to jump in and, and ask us questions and also give us your suggestions on how we can build on this proposal. So, I will start by introducing, um, from nearest to me to furthest, Chris Shi, who is Head of Open Source Strategy at FutureWay. Chris uh, really is kind of the godfather of this initiative. Um, it's his brainchild, and so uh, we are very thankful to him for bringing this group together. Next is Hillary Carter, Senior VP of Research at the Linux Foundation, who actually did some research reports that she's going to uh, speak about during the panel that really inspired this initiative. Um, next to Hillary is Vivian Barnier, CEO of the Inaccess Foundation, uh, which is a nonprofit dedicated to bringing electricity to parts of the world that do not currently have it. Next is Carl Yang, CEO of Degcent Energy Technology. Carl has gotten involved to bring us an open hardware perspective because a lot of our initial discussions were so software focused and we realized that there needs to be a hardware component in order to make this successful. And finally, last but not least, is Tony Shannon, the head of digital services at the office of the CIO of the government of Ireland. Tony has been instrumental in advising us on how we can better engage with the public sector um, and what policy, how policy can help influence these topics going forward. So with that, I'm going to turn to the panel, and we're going to start with Chris. Um, Chris, you're the one who came up with this idea, as I just mentioned, for an initiative around Open Renewable Energy Systems, or ORES, as we're calling it for short. Can you just give us some idea of um, what ORES is and how it came about? 
Sure. Um, I just shared earlier today about uh, the history and the motivation of ORES. One year ago, exactly this, this month, now I, I live in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, in California. One year ago, at this time, we had an uh, atmospheric river event. And that flooded the streets and also the cyclones. My, my house, the roof was ripped off by the cyclones. And uh, I was lucky enough, I only spent $1,000 to fix it. My coworker probably spent about 200000 because they live in a hilly area and uh, they have like uh, maybe 30 meter tall trees that fall down and crush the wall of the, of the house. And today, as we speak right now in California, there are also strong atmospheric river events right now. So at the time, I was thinking, gee, you know, this thing is happening. And what we can do uh, individually, myself, ourselves. So uh, I'm coming from an ICT background. So I was thinking, you know, what we can do from take the expertise and methodology and thought process from ICT perspective. And I think there is a lot of scenery uh, in the energy uh, sector. So take that over to energy, and I see a lot of opportunities there. There's a huge gap in terms of uh, open source and energy. So that's why I was very excited that we joined Landis Foundation Energy, the open source energy. And uh, one of the things what we were thinking about was that we had to really think kind of somewhat backward. As I mentioned, right now we have a centralized electrical system. And everybody is so uh, is benefiting from that, which is you just plug it in to receive energy, receive electricity, and you can plug in many different kind of devices. Now we come to a time we may need to rethink how we consume and how we produce electricity energy. And the idea we had in mind was that why cannot we make it easier to produce energy and to become energy independence? And that's the foundation, foundational motivation of ORES, Open Renewable Energy System. What we're looking to do, I want to say the result, what we, what we envision in the future will be, that everyone will have the opportunity to go to a Costco to buy an ORES compliance device. Right now, you go to Costco, uh, Walmart, you can buy a device so easy, right? You buy a laptop, you buy a microwave, you just use it. Why not the same thing for production of energy? So that is the foundation of this ORES project. That's the motivation. Eventually, we're thinking to have that device, ORES compliant device, where you can buy easily and plug it in at your house. And then you can create your own energy. Eventually, the goal is to have individual energy independence. And that's what we're doing. And the way we want to do it is through open source. And we have done this thing in telecommunication uh, space. And we move that kind of thought process and the methodology over to the energy space through building an open source API and a standard that allows manufacturers to freely adopt those standards and build the ecosystem of manufacturers, vendors of those always compliance devices and to reach to the masses. So this is a grassroots effort. And we are today we are here, fortunate to be here, to invite everyone to join us in this new energy independence movement. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So I'm going to turn to Hillary next. Um, Hillary, I want you to talk a little bit about the part that research played in the development of this initiative. And I know there are two specific reports that you want to touch on. I, and just so you know, behind you, we've got the microgrids report up. Thank you so much, Dan. Hi, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to be back at FOSDEM to um, highlight 
the role that research has played in the establishment of open renewable energy systems, uh, community building. Um, it was more than a year ago, about a year and a half ago, that Chris approached Linux Foundation Research, which is uh, one of the departments that I lead, to test the hypothesis that there was indeed a viable, valid uh, role for open source to create better, cheaper, faster solutions in the microgrid space, a nascent space, um, so that we could have uh, widespread uh, solutions that enable both clean energy generation and increase access uh, to energy solutions in remote areas and areas that have been um, impacted by natural disaster. And so what we did was create uh, a qualitative study and interviewed um, 17 subject matter experts across uh, the energy ecosystem, including people from academia uh, and industry, uh, to pressure test this idea. Was this a good idea? What were the opportunities for the microgrid space um, leveraging open source? How could we take uh, a nascent space and make it mainstream so that uh, energy access is truly democratized and that um, energy supply is readily available? Um, and what's incredibly rewarding is that research has served to plant some of the seeds for this idea and begin to have conversations with stakeholders who then a year and a half later at the formation of such a working group today can become participants. As well, now that we have a deliverable that um, comprises the insights from these experts, we have a document that we can share to say this is the why, this is the how, and here's how you can get involved. Uh, so I encourage you all to read this report. Uh, you can uh, visit uh, LF Energy or Linux Foundation Research or scan the QR code, um, but read it, share it, and um, get involved. Uh, because through greater participation um, and more contributions from developers, we can indeed create a necessary future to democratizing energy, um, clean energy generation, as well as uh, distribution to those who need it most. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. Uh, another report that I'm incredibly passionate about, um, it's fairly recent, and I think might be of interest to all of you because you've come to a discussion about the relationship of, of, between open source and uh, microgrids and, and clean energy, is our sustainability report. And this piece of work discusses uh, not just uh, open source opportunities within the energy sector, uh, but across all open source project communities. And our ability to make the link between open source technical projects and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is a game changer because it is a door opener. It is a door opener to potential collaborators who have a mandate to achieve economic growth by sustainable means to governments, to regulators, to enterprises to other partners and can inspire new con uh, contributors to open source projects that are either intentionally or through uh, applications and uh, use cases doing incredible things to advance sustainable development. Uh, and these reports uh, build bridges and they generate conversations and they are a resource for the whole community. So I encourage you to uh, explore uh, the energy reports that we have, our sustainability report, microgrids report, and beyond, and use them to your own um, uh, interests and advantage. So with that, Dan, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. And I'm going to move over to Vivian. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the challenges of energy access? I have a feeling that a lot of folks don't realize what a problem it is. Um, and exactly how you envision ORES helping address them. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Chris and Hilary. Um, you see behind me a picture, strictly it's like several pictures matched together because luckily we never have this situation on Earth so that everything is in the night. Um, but 
it pictures pretty well the situation that um, without showing you, I think you see that there are areas where you possibly know there are a lot of people living, but you almost see no light. Um, this is because there is no electricity. Um, and that's actually bringing electricity to these areas is like sustainable development goal number seven, no? which uh, was just mentioned. And that's where, where we and access focus on, and uh, sorry, I have to correct you then. We, as an access, don't bring directly ex uh, energy to people, but we want to facilitate the access to energy through leveraging open source. And uh, thank you, Hillary, actually, to, to highlight and for this report, because the idea of an access doing this work is like based on the individual feeling of a few practitioners of the energy access sector that open source is underexploited there. And that's where an access was founded, but we never had a proper research paper or something that supported our like vision and mission and our beliefs and now we have. Um, so that's, that's great, great to see like to see this confirmation that uh, we are doing the right thing in the right direction. Um, and now I, I would like to show on the next slide a bit what, oh, that's um, and not the one I was expecting, but uh, <laughs> it's all good. That underlines the, the need for open source because you can see that there's a lot of electricity, electrification that has been ongoing over the last decade However, now we have a reverse trend. So we have more people get being unelectrified every year instead of less. And one, surely not the only one, but one of the main reasons is also there is interoperability missing. There are too much stakeholders. There's a lot of stakeholders, which is great, and there are more stakeholders emerging. It's an Eastern sector, as you said. But do say, stakeholders often develop their own things by their own in parallel, often with donor money from the same donor developing the same solution or pretty similar solution to then provide electricity to people instead of having a baseline infrastructure which is shared, which has a common standard and common API, just as Chris said, where then the companies can build on and build their ecosystem and their business model around by doing little tweaks there, here and there where it's necessary. But I, I've seen like small utility companies, like mini good companies, developing smart meters, like 10 of them. Where it's like, yeah, you don't need to develop a smart meter, you need to sell electricity and you need somebody to provide you a smart meter. And maybe your business case is a bit different for each of you, but don't lose your time developing like another smart meter yet. So, and that's just one example. And this happens all the time. And that's where we believe the power of open source really needs to be leveraged more in the energy access sector. And that's where we believe to bring this perspective into the, the OS initiative. And yeah, I'm happy to pass over the mic. All right, thank you, and apologies about the slide. I, I thought we got that updated. Um, well, next we'll move to Carl, uh, who, as I mentioned before, is bringing a bit of a hardware perspective for us. Um, Carl, can you talk about the state of uh, the overall residential equipment market? for energy and um, how you see ORES playing a part in that. Uh, so uh, this is our uh, POC. Uh, this is our POC uh, for the hardware to integrate uh, with the architecture. Uh, for device, we have uh, like a micro inverter, uh, BMS, and uh, also uh, we call it a uh, AC uh, battery, uh, and also the DC DC uh, converter. Uh, the goal uh, for the POC is uh, together with the community, with the uh, Linux Foundation energy projects, uh, we pro we provide the low voltage. Uh, it's safe, you know, higher quality and uh, low price. So our customer. We can can do it uh, yourself. Uh, for this part, uh, mostly uh, aligned with the power energy uh, specification and the regulation. Uh, uh, this part, uh, you know, uh, we propose a first uh, strategy for the 
for the implementation for the POC. The most important thing uh, for current phase is the uh, co communication, uh, is the communication. Uh, also, also for with the software management integration part, uh, we focus on the energy flexibility based on the S2 uh, standard uh, uh, integrated with uh, uh, EMS uh, implementation, open source implementation. Uh, later, we may uh, focus on the uh, open solution with the operation and the big data. Uh, basically, the goal is we uh, try to pro provide uh, together with the uh, open source community, uh, community uh, for the hardware from black box to white box. Here, uh, we are going to align with the uh, OIS architecture design protocol and the uh, API. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, and now to Tony um, to give us the public sector perspective. Um, can you talk about why this initiative is needed from your perspective and what part can policy play in advancing it? Sure, thanks, Dan. Uh, I, I, I don't need to, I guess, convince anybody here uh, that whatever level you're looking at, the challenges that we face as a people, um, be it at a community level or a government level, this is decades in time that really matters. Um, what I, when I speak, I talk about a moment that really matters. And I think we're all aware of the challenges that you know, are faced around the world in terms of improving the lives of people and looking after the planet that we live on. So we all have a challenge ahead of us in terms of people and planet. And this decade towards 2030 is a, is a pivotal moment in time in that sense. We know the policy frameworks out there talk about the need for a digital transition and a green transition. Um, and you know that's, again, widely understood. But there's always and often a challenge in terms of a gap between a nice and a aspirational policy and its implementation. And how do you get to solve the problems of people and planet using, using digital and green in a scalable and sustainable way? Those are, those are key questions. We know that, for instance, if you look at the energy sector, um, it is at least in, in part weighed down by the proprietary nature of the systems that are at play. And Dan already mentioned the top-down nature of the way energy is delivered. So that's not really, doesn't really point to, to how to, 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 to tackle the problem. What we know is, and Obviously, FOSDEM is, is, is a living example of that. If you want to tackle some of the most complex problems in the world, you start from the bottom up. You innovate from the bottom up. You have small working groups like you're all made up of that come up with ideas as to how to fix problems, and you scale them and sustain them from the bottom up. And Dan, if you could move to the next slide, perhaps. I might talk to a related pattern. I, I talk a lot about the complexity of of the challenge ahead of us, but if you're looking at complex challenges, you need to simply talk about patterns. And I think we know in the public service that actually the, the challenges that are required uh, fall down in terms of patterns around people and process and, and technology. And there's a really interesting uh, initiative out there called GovStack, which some of you may or may not be aware of, but it's about what are the building blocks required to deliver 21st uh, public services, and there are only about 20 that, that are, that if, you, if you boil them all down, and if you can focus on those core building blocks, you can transform the lives of people uh, using open source and reusable building blocks to, to, to tra change the way the world operates. I'm pretty sure that, you know, the same principle holds true for the power, the energy transition we need to face. The question, and I think the challenge that Ores is trying to tackle is, what are the building blocks that are required to accommodate and move on the energy transition from the bottom up? And that's why this uh, work on microgrids and the Ores project really offered the potential for a bottom-up revolution and innovation in the way energy is delivered uh, that can be empowered really by people like yourselves to get involved in that effort.
because all we need to do is solve this at the bottom and take it up from there and that will transform the way the world operates. Um, and I'll pause there. I think that was very well said, so thank you, Tony. Um, so I do have more questions that I can ask the panelists, but um, I kind of want to open it and see if there are any thoughts from the audience. I'm first going to go ahead and put um, this up in case anyone is interested and wants to learn more. Uh, the QR code on your left is to join our mailing list. The one on the right is a wiki. If you go to the wiki, there's not much there. So this, um, this working group is still in the formation stage. We are not even an official LF Energy working group yet, but we did not want to miss the opportunity to present this idea to a FOSDEM audience because we really do think that there are a lot of folks here who would be interested and can um, help us uh, progress this forward. Um, it actually speaks to the power of FOSDEM that just since uh, yesterday's energy dev room, the size of our potential working group has pretty much doubled already because uh, we met so many great folks here. Um, I see Luis coming right up here actually, and he's one of them, um, who are getting uh, interested in getting involved. Um, for the couple hours before this panel, we actually all got together uh, in the uh, little bar cafe area and started debating what this is going to look like. Um, and I'll say, it's a debate. Like, we don't even agree on what this should look like. We don't agree on how the standards should be structured. We don't agree what kind of specs there should be. We don't agree on um, what the hardware and software components should be. But that's what working groups are for. And that's what uh, is great about open source, is it provides us the opportunity to build a community that can debate these issues. So. Um, I'm happy to open it to questions and see if there or comments and see if the audience has any thoughts. Um, if you have ideas, if you have suggestions, or if you have questions for um, anyone on the panel, um, please feel free to come forward. And if not, I do have questions I can ask, but uh, I, I want to really give you all the opportunity first. Which, uh, which countries in the world do you think are the most fertile ground for these kind of changes? Or which are the worst? You know, which would resist them the hardest? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. And, and my answer is rooted in uh, one of the contributors to the research report. Some of the most advanced work in microgrids has come out of the University of Alaska in the United States. And I can bet everyone here appreciates why that is. It's a remote state, isolated from the rest of the United States geographically. And um, shipping power to remote parts of the world is expensive, it's wasteful, and so on and so forth. So I'm very encouraged by some of the academic research coming out of the United States to help proliferate at least the ideas. There is a lot of motivation from people in remote communities all over the world. Um, so I think maybe it's not so much the country, but uh, some of the attributes of the leading stakeholders. Are you uh, in a remote area of um, the developed world? And of course, the, the, some of the underdeveloped countries just have this deep need for access to power uh, so that they can plug in and participate in online communities. And I wonder if Vivian has any thoughts there as well. I, I know you're coming from an energy access perspective. I'm not 100% sure if I got the question. I got it's about a country. What exactly was the question? Which country is the most the, a fertile ground? OK. Um, yeah, I mean, as Hillary said, surely in the industrialized world, region like Alaska or state like Alaska, for sure, me looking into uh, like unindustrialized or underindustrialized regions. For example, you can look at Nigeria, which is a country which actually has a power grid or several power grids, but they are extremely unstable and there is a very huge community of companies and individuals working throughout solving it by isolated or interconnected mini grids or micro grids. So that's definitely a geography and the general setting and also Nigeria is relatively good in, let's say, accessibility to like tech 
And uh, so, yeah, that's definitely one of the regions in the country, but I mean, there are plenty uh, other regions to, to just to name one. Thank you. And it looks like we have another question. Yes. Um, um, have you thought about um, looking into the home automation community? Because I think, uh, I think OpenHAB has a booth over here, so, um, and there are other home automation, open source home automation systems, which I think already have energy management on their agenda or have some partial solutions. Yes, yeah, okay. So the question looks like uh, there are some, first, some organizations, similar organizations, like the energy organization. Uh, and uh, what I was thinking is that we don't segregate between organizations. Whoever, who are interested, okay, who are interested in this area, please just scan the QR code, join the mailing list, and have that conversation and be part of this movement to become a, a sustainable energy uh, part of the future. Uh, in terms of uh, technical details on is this an energy uh, management system, definitely there are all this uh, EMS, BMS, uh, virtual power plant, microgrid, all of this terminology will be involved in this uh, project. So. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm thinking, yeah. Just to add quickly on that one, and it, it actually came up as Dan said, our working group has like doubled since yesterday, and one of the inputs from the, from the new members were exactly to looking into this existing home automation, open source organizations, companies that are already around. They are not yet part of it, but um, more than welcome to pull them in. Uh, in, in the best way we can, it makes total sense. That's right. Uh, I see uh, the microphone's up there, so uh, Chris, we'll get you next. <laughs> so, um, somewhat re related to that, that past question, um, uh, some academic studies show that by far the cheapest uh, way to make reliable grids which, are, which rely heavily on renewable energy is to incorporate a lot of uh, what's called demand response so that uh, consumers can be sent signals either with or without financial incentives to reduce their demand as an alternative to employing things like gas power plants or large battery arrays or indeed expensive transmission systems. Um, and I, I think I see this as so some of the most important area that it's in to get open source into because I, I see sort of lots of closed silos and gatekeepers trying to set up in these areas at the moment um, and, um, and also huge problems with things like security and privacy on an individual basis. Um, I mean, is the, I, I mean, this is also great because you, you will get a lot of sort of Western hackers wanting to engage in this because it solves their own problem as well. Um, so, I mean, is this something the, the, um, that you're sort of planning to focus on heavily or is this a sort of peripheral goal or? I'll, I'll just quickly try to handle that. I think, Dan, the LF Energy, the, the demand response stuff that you're talking about is, is acknowledged as probably part of the overall solution here. And, Dan, there's, there's related work on LF Energy that we'd expect to plug into that. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I didn't catch all of the question, but um, if you're asking about uh, uh, generally demand response, um, yes, I mean, that's something that's already uh, big utilities are having to deal with that right now um, as they onboard renewables. Um, uh, because uh, load balancing is becoming more difficult uh, when you have renewables versus being able to just turn up a gas turbine or, or not. Um, and so a lot of that is being driven by new ML tools, AI tools. These are things that LF Energy is already doing on a utility scale. Um, I think it probably, some of that 
I'm, and I'm not the most technically minded person, so uh, some of that may be scalable down to something like what we're talking about with ORES, um, but there also may be new tools that we need to develop as part of this initiative um, to meet that sort of uh, use case as well. Can I, oh, can I do another, <clears throat> tying into the previous two, it's sort of a scoping question. It seems to me that you have two. So can you move the microphone closer to your mouth? We oh, can't I'm hear sorry. you up here. I'm usually so loud people are complaining in the next country. Um, it seems to me you have a scoping issue here. There's two obvious cohorts you could apply to, either the underserved at the moment, you know, in the middle of uh, Africa, or it could be the balcony solar crowd. I proposed something to our UK energy minister in 2009, which is balcony solar. Now, if you do the latter, you're not bringing electricity to new people, but you are helping people contribute to it, and you'll get lots of Western hackers, etc. Uh, do you want to rule out the balcony solar crowd or rule them into your solution? Because it seems that you've got two very separate targets there. Um, I hear a statement as opposed to a question that we're dealing with two very different cohorts. Yeah, yeah you've got the underserved and you've got the already well served but balcony solar, you could do some guerrilla generation and you'll get lots of feedback. Who wants to take that? Okay, okay, I think, uh, let me, let me uh, uh, add something into that. I heard uh, several things, right? Demand response and also security, right? from the previous uh, countries. And uh, these are very important aspects. And uh, um, first of all, demand response. This is related to the, uh, as, uh, the utility health and uh, how we can help uh, the utilities. And our as project, at the beginning, we start with uh, a residential level, small grassroot uh, projects. But eventually, we want to uh, have Industrialized uh, the industrial focus applications and uh, maybe utility applications down the road, but we're starting from you know our human center, yeah, human center and then uh, house uh, residential uh, level in the first place. In terms of the security, this is very important. Uh, we want to make sure our the devices are secure and uh, secure by design. Uh, what we mean by that is that, for example, we have a so-called auto autonomous mode, which does not you know uh, connect to the uh, network at all in the first place, uh, and also you can have a uh, uh, federated mode, uh, meaning they join a federation and then they work together in collaboratively. Uh, so that's a little bit more on the architecture side of this, that this working group is collectively going to define together. So um, if you join the group, then you have more exposure and discussion uh, and uh, contribute your thought as well. Welcome. Thank you. Next. Chris. Okay. Um, hello, Chris Adams, Green Web Foundation. This sounds really, really cool. I really, really like it. Um, it seems one of the takeaways I took away was that it seems to be about decoupling future energy access from burning fossil fuels, which seems to be a really, really good thing, rather more so than converting existing demand uh, uh, to like uh, that's already connected to the grid, right? Um, we, you know that when we have a transition, we're, we're switching from burning fuel to having access to finance. And one of the problems when people do, when people talk about energy access is the different ways to pay for it. Could you talk a little bit about the role of finance and how that would play a role in this? Because I kind of get how this would make it cheaper, which is good, but there's still a really, really big thing to address there. I see a Hillary nodding, nodding so maybe if I I'll, I'll put it to you first, perhaps. Finance, so making it affordable and cheaper and accessible for people. Um, I, I'm going to refer to a previous report that, that I had produced, um, which was focusing on decentralized energy and incentivizing uh, the establishment of the prosumer energy movement. And, and if we look at Brooklyn, New York, there was a project called the Brooklyn Microgrid. There was no energy access problem in Brooklyn. There was an experiment to see if we could do better, if we could produce clean energy ourselves on our roofs to rooftops, share it, and not be in violation of any regulation. 
Um, and these ideals are absolutely possible. We just have to put in the mechanisms and have favorable regulation so that people can produce their own energy. If they have an excess energy, sell it to their neighbor and do that within a regulatory framework and a payments framework that is accessible and affordable and universal. So all of these building blocks need to come um, together. It really requires the collaboration of governments and regulators to make microgrids possible, whether they are in Brooklyn or whether they're in Nigeria. Um, and also giving people the incentive to charge their devices at non-peak hours. One of the experiments that we, a pilot project that took place in Canada was with um, our energy distribution operator as well as a payments network and um, using um, a blockchain technology giving uh, actual economic incentives to people to make green choices. And until we commercialize green so that it is cheaper and uh, a, a better, or just more accessible than uh, fossil burning, fossil fuel burning choices, uh, we're just not gonna get there as quickly. We have to work with it, government incentives and uh, individual incentives. Yeah, did Vivian or I thought maybe Tony or Vivian want, oh, oh Chris, yeah. please. Yeah, I think the, the key word here is uh, uh, finance or affordability, right? And this is exactly what ORES is trying to address. Why? Look now, if you want to install your home energy system, at least my, from America, I live in California, the company will approach me saying, okay, if you want to install a Tesla system in your house, that cost you about forty to fifty thousand dollars. Half of that is going to be labor cost, permitting cost, uh, all the other uh, installation things. The rest will be equipment. But if we do with our way, that's where the thing happens. It's open. When it's open, what that means is open standard. That means it drives and try to build and foster an ecosystem of vendors and suppliers installers. Once you have mass adoption of this, then the prices will go down, both in terms of uh, the labor cost and in terms of the, uh, the equipment cost. Especially, that was the reason, one of the motivation of ORES design is the plug and play to reduce the labor cost. That, that $25,000 right off the bat is gone. You see? That's, that's the open source way, and uh, that will systematically and dramatically reduce the cost of renewable energy systems. That was the one of the prime motivation of ORES. Okay, so that's why. Please join us. Um, I'm. I'm not sure if you were also asking particularly about the finance question for energy access in particular. So is this possibly going beyond this panel? I'm uh, pretty happy to engage with you in the discussion after because I've worked in this area quite a lot and would say, as Chris said and Hillary said, we are contributing to it, but it's, I mean, we can't solve all problems at the same time. It's, we, might drive down the costs to make it easier, but we are not like a financing mechanism. We're not lending a new financing mechanism to it. It's also needed, and uh, maybe Tony has some ideas um, <laughs> on the policy side. So, I mean, yeah, the, the finance aspect is reducing costs here, not inventing or developing another finance mechanism. And great if somebody has ideas and make that open source even better. Um, <laughs> Right, another question? Um, on the joining part, so uh, can you tell us about the prerequisites for someone to make a meaningful contribution? Or put another way, I'm just a software developer. I don't know any about energy distribution, hardware stuff. What can I contribute? What can I bring to the table? I mean, I can talk a little bit about that, and I'll let the panel weigh in as well. but. Um, you know, this is true of any open source project, like anyone can contribute, 
um, and get involved. You don't have to necessarily contribute code. Uh, you can contribute. We, we will need help with organization. We will need help with marketing. We will not need help. We'll probably be doing events and um, uh, notes keeping and um, maintaining websites. And um, if you're interested in contributing in that sort of way, please still sign up for the mailing list and, and let us know that. Um, I'll happily give you tasks to do. And uh, one thing, if you don't, like, if you don't know anything, your, your question is, if you don't know anything about energy, how do I contribute? Things like that, right? And then one, everybody in this room, you can do, you can help contribute. Just spread the word, okay? Take the picture of those QR code, send it to your friends, right? Spread the word. Not, not only particularly in this working group, this, uh, this project, okay, is the open renewable en uh, energy system, this project per se, but spread the concept, the mission of ORS. Okay, we want to get more people involved and let's think about ways how we can help create re renewable energy uh, uh, resources and uh, to live more sustainably. Just one more addition, and pretty sure from here in a few months down the line, we will have very specific work tasks that need to be addressed and that can perfectly be addressed by somebody without any energy background. So that's, yeah, could go on the mailing list, uh, stay tuned, and it will get every time more concrete and also more detached from particular energy or energy access knowledge. All right, and I see we've got about three minutes left, so I think you'll be the last question. It's really interesting to hear from you guys, and I thought it was also interesting how you said there are so many different ideas about the approach to the problem. So I was wondering, like, what are the main conflicting perspectives or ideas about the implementation of this idea? Sorry, the implementation of... Of, um, like... Someone may repeat your question. The conflicting ideas about the like implementation of like the whole system that you guys were describing. Oh, oh, what uh, I, I alluded to that um, there was some disagreement in our earlier working group meeting. <laughs> yeah, we have more agreement than disagreement. Okay? This is true. Yes, there is more agreement <laughs> than disagreement. Otherwise, we don't have that many people come here, right? So, so your question is about more implementation. Is that right? Yeah, like what are the disagreements essentially? What are disagreements? Yes. Oh. Uh, I think the disagreement, you know what? I don't really think we have much disagreement. The, I think the reason we have a lot of discussion was because there are maybe some understandings, right? It is, it is a loud, very loud room. Sometimes we couldn't communicate here each other clearly. But eventually, eventually, people come together. Eventually, people come. That demonstrates a lot of interest, a lot of consensus, and also a lot of passion. People now are joining together into this project. Uh, so that was it. But if, in, with respect to detailed implementation, then you will know that we will join the mailing list, the working group. Then we'll have more discussion as to how we're going to do this. We, we got some ideas already, and, uh, and uh, just uh, come join us. Sorry, just a quick word on perspectives and implementation. I mean, for me, the, the issue is um, perfection is the enemy of the good, as you all know. So I'm here because I believe this mission, but we need to see this in action. So there's, we, we're trying to find the common ground. Where do we get a first implementation? Kick it around see how it works, see how it doesn't work, go from there. It's as simple as that. All right, uh, any final word? We've got about one minute left. I just wanted to say, I think there was more um, conversation around who should we invite? How do we get started? Like, what are the priority issues? It was more, we're, we're, this is a big idea, and uh, we, we want as many people involved um, as possible, and so I echo uh, Chris and Dan and everybody on this panel to say spread the word, uh, share uh, what you've learned today, uh, share the reports uh, if they help bring in new stakeholders and uh, we look forward to 
um, hearing from you. All right, thank you all so much. Feel free to grab any of us afterwards if you have any other questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I th is this the... Thanks, okay. I want to say one, one more thing. Is, I'm not sure, is there, this seem to be the last? Is it the last? There's one more, okay, that, well this is the second to the last uh, conversation here. So if people stay here this long, after these two days of photo, give you guys a big shot, okay? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, join us and uh, we'll all be part of this movement. Thank you guys.